Welcome to today um, to a secondary school talk on careers in quantum technologies and today we're going to focus on communications. So this is a series of talks uh, working with quantum physics um, to try and give you a diverse understanding about um, behind the scenes on quantum physics. Um, in a minute I'll pass over to Ruth um, who is going to talk, go through today about quantum physics in more depth and introduce you to the different speakers we've got today. But in the meantime, if it's your first time using um, MS Teams Live, I just want to make sure you're aware of how it's going to work. So just so you're aware is there's no webcams or microphones enabled for yourselves. However, we do have a live Q&A chat. So please use this throughout where you can actually ask any questions what we'll get to at the end. Um, so I'll hand over um, to Ruth. Thank you, James. And next slide, please. So um, it's great to have all of you here today and have so many of you joining us. So thank you for that. As James said, this is the first talk in a series on careers in quantum technologies, with today focusing on quantum communication. So before I hand you over to our excellent researchers, I'm just going to tell you a little bit more background about this. So first of all, what is quantum physics? Well, everything you can see around you can be described using the laws of classical physics. So things like Newton's laws of motion that you might have come across. However, when we zoom into the atomic scale and we start looking at things like atoms, electrons, photons, those laws no longer apply because things behave differently. And that's why we need quantum physics to explain how they work. Now, quantum technologies, they are technologies that use quantum physics to do useful things. So they do already exist in things like lasers and computers. However, there's a new generation of quantum technologies being developed that are going to do some really amazing new and exciting things. So they use things like entanglement and superposition, properties of quantum physics that you might have heard of. Now, the, in the UK, we have what's called the UK National Quantum Technologies Programme, and that's a £1 billion investment over 10 years into the development of these new and exciting technologies that are going to make things that were previously impossible possible. And as part of that programme, we have four quantum technology hubs, so they're massive research collaborations working to develop specific aspects of quantum technologies. So there's one on quantum communications, one on quantum sensing, one on quantum imaging, and one on quantum computing. And I'm joining you today from the Quantum Communications Hub. Um, now our aim is to develop ultimately secure communications technologies. So these are technologies that can operate at all distance scales and are provably secure. They're unhackable because they use quantum physics. OK, and we're working to bring them out of the research lab and into the real world. So to commercialize these technologies. So it's my pleasure to introduce you to three researchers today who are going to tell you a little bit more about their work in this area and the fascinating technologies that they are developing and the applications of those along with their career journeys so far. So you can see the kind of exciting opportunities that exist within this new and brilliant field of quantum technologies. So we've got Dr Ross Donaldson from Harriet Watt University joining us. We've also got Dr Catherine Phillips from the University of Sheffield and Dr Jasmine de Sidhu from the University of Strathclyde. So without any further ado, I'll hand over to you Ross. Thank you Ruth and hello to everyone online. So as we said, I'm Dr. Ross Donaldson. I'm a, an academic and a researcher here at Harriet Watt University. Uh, so my job is, is about lecturing, but it, most of what I do is actually hands-on research with uh, a research team that I run. Uh, so I have a small research team, 10 people, uh, which is all focused on quantum innovation. So it's taking, as we said, these quantum technologies that we're developing in the lab and actually working with industrial partners such as BT and other big players to take it from the lab out to the real world into the hands of end users like yourself. So you can see here a couple of photos. One is on the left hand side is my research team back in uh, 2020, just before the lockdown. Another one is me. Uh, actually doing the hands-on work uh, back in 2018 when I started my job. Uh, next slide, please. So where did it all start for me? Uh, and it was about probably the same age as a lot of you are this now, uh, 13, 14, when I started to take physics and chemistry as part of science courses. Uh, and one thing that really intrigued me was actually nuclear physics, uh, in particular nuclear energy, and using that as a green source of energy. So splitting the atom uh, to create energy and making two smaller atoms. Uh, but beyond just uranium, I was also interested in things like nuclear fusion. So harnessing the power of the sun uh, to create essentially cheap energy here on Earth. As well as that, there's also different fuels. Uh, so uranium is one, but thorium is another one, which could be better. And also rather than investing in these massive power plants, 
uh, you know, nuclear powered submarines, have these small reactors which generate electricity and power. Why don't we use those uh, in smaller and safer cases to actually generate energy? And also uh, in terms of space, so when you send a spacecraft up, you, uh, when you're looking at Earth or, or orbiting objects, you tend to have solar panels to get energy. Uh, when you go out into the solar system, uh, you have to actually heat electronics and power things using radioactive elements. And this was all what interested me and got me really into the, the science direction. So essentially when I was 14, 15, I was actually looking to have a career much similar to Homer Simpson working on a nuclear power plant. And although I didn't go down that route in the end, I still eat a lot of donuts and, and, and drink a lot of beer as well. Uh, so next slide, please. So after I was going down that science route, I, I did my hires in physics and chemistry, and then I went off to university at Harriet Watt to do a, a master's in engineering physics. So I was still always interested in the applied side of physics. Uh, when I was at Harry Watt, I managed to get involved in a lot of different opportunities, uh, which I think a lot of students don't get involved in uh, and regret at a later stage. So I was involved in the Physics Society, running that for a few years, as well as running uh, and attending a lot of national and international uh, conferences, which allowed me to network with lots of different students around the world. As well as that, I took a couple of summer internships where I worked in research labs with academics doing real research that ended up being published. Uh, and I did two of those while I was at Harry Watt. And in fact, the one in the single photon group actually led me to leave my degree a year earlier to start a PhD in quantum communications, which was just starting to gain momentum as this quantum technology V2 that Ruth is mentioning. Uh, after my PhD, I did a few different research contracts and actually had the opportunity to go to Japan for a year uh, to, not a year, uh, a, month, a month, not a year, <laughs> uh, to, to work in the National Institute of Communication Technologies in Tokyo. And that was a really eye-opening experience for me, working in a, a world-leading research lab uh, with a completely different culture, which was great. Uh, next slide. So after my, my research contracts, I ended up becoming this academic and research fellow here at Harriet Watt. And now I do things which are, are very much uh, in the practical side of things. So it's about building systems like you see here. So this isn't a photo of my system just yet. Uh, we're hoping to have a similar photo next year. And the aim of this system that we're creating is a telescope to do essentially laser communications with satellites. So my focus is the ground station element and getting all these quantum technologies on that telescope so that we can connect to, as Jasminder will talk about next, uh, these quantum satellites which are going to be launched in the next few years. And final slide. Uh, so if I had to give some advice uh, looking back, uh, I'd say that perfection isn't produ produ productive. And actually, as a, as a young person, you need to be more productive than a perfectionist because you need to get lots of stuff done, learn from mistakes and just do a lot of things. Uh, and I think that's something a lot of people forget. They like to make something perfect and get one thing done rather than doing lots of different things and, uh, and showing off. Uh, another thing is your career's already started. So although you're thinking about it's just about grades at the moment, actually a lot of the things you're doing, whether it's sports teams or getting involved in organisations, that experience and personal development is really important at, the, at that early stage as well. Uh, and it's what companies will be asking you about in terms of experience. And uh, the final point is happiness is also a measure of success. Uh, so a lot of people focus on getting a really good job to get good money or be in power, uh, positions of power. Um, actually being happy is a really important thing for your mental health and also your physical health and it's a lot what a lot of people don't talk about uh, and i think it's important to realize that while you're young and that's me thank you hi i'm catherine i'm from the university of sheffield where i research single photon sources which is what i'm going to be talking about uh, in a bit so my talk is slightly different to ross's so i am only very briefly going to talk about how i got here and more about what i do at the minute so if you have next slide please so how did i get to be a quantum researcher so at uh, a levels i already knew that i liked doing science so i'd always liked science i also really liked sort of physical geography and geology so i did physics chemistry maths and geology for my a levels so sort of on towards the second year of that, was, I decided that actually physics was the one that really interested me the most. So that's what I applied to do at university. So I applied to the University of Sheffield to do a master's degree in physics. So you could do lots of different physics courses. There's chemical physics, physics with astrophysics, physics with particle physics, physics with uh, biological physics. So I decided instead to just do physics as a subject on a whole because I I liked lots of bits of physics and I didn't want to pick a little bit to do more of, so I wanted to do all of it. So it worked out very well for me. So in the first year, the stuff I loved was astrophysics. I mean, you look at the pictures of, that Hubble do and it's like, how can you not love that? They're gorgeous. 
Uh, but then I discovered particle physics. Particle physics is also very fun. They have massive hadron, like the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, which is very cool. So I did a 10 week, 10 week summer project uh, at CERN in my third year, where I actually got to build parts of stuff that go into one of the upgrades to detectors. So that was what told me that I wanted to do experimental physics. I wanted to do a sciencey job that was hands on, that I'd actually get to touch and play with stuff. So then I looked instead at, um, rather than looking at very small physics, looked at accelerator physics. So that would be actually the accelerators themselves. I also then instead did it for my master's project. I got introduced through quantum optics. So I did a project on 2D materials uh, with a research group at Sheffield. I loved it. I got to play with lasers, lenses, mirrors, cryogenic gases. It was great. So that was what convinced me that I wanted to do a PhD in this. So for my PhD, I moved slight topics. I moved to quantum dot research, still quantum optics, but not 2D materials. And I'm still at the University of Sheffield. Um, what I talk about next basically links my PhD and postdoctoral research. So I will talk about both of them at the same time. And then when I finished that, I've been doing uh, research now for about two years. So still at the University of Sheffield. They haven't managed to get rid of me yet. Um, next slide, please. So my job title is Research Associate in Semiconductor Quantum Optics at Telecommunications Wavelength. It's a bit of a mouthful, but you can shorten it to basically researching single photon sources. So what's a single photon source? So light, light is weird. Light is both particle and wave. It behaves as both. So a photon is the smallest possible particle of light. And what we want is a way of making uh, these single photons appear one at a time. Basically, when you push a button, you get a photon. We want them to all be identical. So to all have exactly the same energy, uh, say wavelength, and basically be undis indistinguishable from each other. Next slide, please. So if we take the first part of the job title, research associate. What is a research associate? In my case, a research associate is an experimental physicist. So I work in a lab, which is great. So this is where I spend most of my time. So because I work mostly with lights, this is an optics lab. So we measure the wavelength of light. We use mirrors and optics to guide lasers around. We use lots of lasers. And then all, we also use cryogenics. So my sample is sat in a lovely warm cryostat, which is at minus 268 degrees in there. It's having a great time. Um, next slide, please. So then you get to the semiconductor quantum optics part of the title. So the way we're making these single photons is by using quantum dots. So on the left, you can see a quantum dot. This is tiny, tiny, tiny little structure, which is about 50 nanometers across and five to 10 nanometers high. It's basically a tiny little pile of atoms inside um, a bigger semiconductor structure. So because this uh, tiny quantum dot is so small, you can use it to trap um, electrons in it. So in a way, it behaves, we, uh, we use the analogy of it being an artificial atom. So it's a little bit like an atom in that basically if you shine light onto it, you can then excite it just like you would in Rutherford model. So uh, electron shells, you excite, you send uh, a laser in, you excite an electron up to a higher energy level. Then sometime later it de-excites back down to where it would like to be and it releases energy of that separation. So that energy that's released comes in the form of one photon. So we're looking, so that's what we're trying to collect. And then we also use sort of fancy structures like the ones on the right to actually route this light around. So all of this stuff is happening in semiconductor wafers. So these are really, really thin wafers, about mm, 300 or so nanometers thick. So very, very thin. And then by making holes and trenches it, we can guide the light to travel through these wafers and go where we want it to. So we can make circuits using light rather than electricity, which is awesome. Uh, next slide, please. So the next slide is possibly the important bit as to where it fits into the real world, which is telecommunications wavelengths. So we're trying to make photons at telecommunications wavelengths. So uh, under all the streets and all the way around the world, you have fiber optic cables and they transmit information using lights, normally laser pulses from one place to another. So this is how fiber optic broadband, etc., works. They have a wavelength that they like to be at. So these fibers transmit best at around 1,500 nanometers with the wavelength of light. So what we're doing is trying to find ways of making photons that emit at those uh, that happen at those wavelengths rather than other wavelengths, so that we can get them to travel down these fibers and actually go into the existing fiber network. 
So the reason we care about single photons is in communications is for security. So say you have a person Alice and a person Bob and Alice sends a message one photon at a time to Bob and somebody tries to eavesdrop on it. They can because you can't split a photon into anything smaller. If Eve takes some of those photons out, Bob knows there's somebody that's stealing the information off that line. They know it's not secure and they can stop sending information. So it doesn't stop you hacking it, but it's it lets you know it's being hacked so you can stop sending information. Next slide, please. So sort of what I've learned sort of through my career path to get where I am now is that don't worry if you don't know what to do, uh, you want to do. There are careers you've never imagined. So I didn't find out that quantum optics was a thing until my fourth year of undergrad and now I do it as a job. So find what you like doing, keep following that and don't worry if you find that you like something and then you, next year you like something else. Swap and change until you find the thing that really makes you want to get up in the morning because that way you'll have the most fun. Thank you. Brilliant, thanks Catherine. So um, I'm going to talk about, so I'm Jasmine Desidu and uh, I work in satellite based quantum communication. So the topic wise is a bit closer to what Ross described uh, earlier. Um, but when we think of quantum and space, what do we think? So we've got some infographics on the next slides. Um, yeah, so if we think of space, we've got our project, we've got Earth and we've got the beautiful stars in the background, that's great. But what do we think of when we, when we mention quantum? We already have a few ideas based on some of the information that both Ross and Catherine described. Um, next slide, please. So we might think of these as subatomic particles, like these photons, okay? So that's what we've got on the left. We might have a funky atom with all the energy levels that are sh shown in the top right. Or if you're inspired by sci-fi, then you might be thinking of the USS Enterprise. Not sure, but I, I certainly did. Uh, next slide. And yeah, if you're a Star Wars fan, then yeah, you have the uh, Millennium Falcon. Anyway, so, um, so quantum mechanics, as Ruth described at the beginning, really is a new framework for mechanics that describes fundamental particles. Uh, and there's a few key departures that we uh, from classical mechanics. And the first one is that key quantities like energy and time that we learn of in perhaps GCSE, uh, they, they take specific values, so they're not continuous. OK, uh, so that's a key difference. The second thing is that as uh, Catherine mentioned, uh, photons can behave both as uh, particles and waves. And a third thing is it's non-deterministic. So unlike in classical mechanics, where you know if you have if you kick a football, say, uh, at a specific time, you'll know where it will be given certain initial conditions that you're aware of. That's not the case with quantum mechanics. You can only know probabilistically. You can say, oh, it might be here, it might be there. And a consequence of this is what you may have heard of uh, is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Um, another key departure from classical mechanics is what we call tunneling. So, you know, if you consider a ball which has a kinetic energy, okay, which is less than a pot potential barrier, so it can't go up, so it's just oscillating in. Well, what can happen in quantum mechanics is that it can actually tunnel through the barrier. And that's a property that's used in a lot of technologies which we'll kind of touch on and and the perhaps the most important resource is uh, entanglement okay so that's where two systems you can't really describe each one individually because they're they're interacted in such a way that if you affect one you actually affect the other as well and so these properties are used for a range of different quantum technologies that across the hubs we're trying to work on realizing and the first one that you see is quantum computing where some of our current super con uh, computers aren't really that super for specific applications. Um, and we have sensors, we also have communications and the, the underlying principle behind communications is really the entanglement. If you interact one system, then you can detect it. So you can actually detect an eavesdropper. So that gives you secure communications. And then we also have um, um, quantum sensors where basically you can sense uh, uh, um, stuff 
a lot more precisely than you can with classical sensors. So this is really the kind of landscape that we're trying to work on across all the different hubs in the UK. And I'm involved, as I said, on the communication side of things. So next slide, please. So how do I fit in? So um, I've previously worked in quantum imaging and sensing. I now work on satellite based quantum communications, uh, working alongside industry to help design launch UK missions. And as part of the job, we have to communicate what we do. Um, and so I've, I've been involved in communicating a lot of the research that I do at schools and science festivals. And it's also something that's really fun because you get to share some of the ideas that you're working on. Uh, and, and that's really cool. Next slide, please. So how I got here. So at school, I was really interested in maths. Uh, but then as in A level, I started doing different modules in maths. I really like the mechanics module. So it was really the applied sort of side of maths that I enjoyed. So I changed my mind and I went to what, went to do physics at Imperial College where I did my masters. Uh, I then moved further north to beautiful Sheffield where I did uh, quantum sensing and imaging uh, as a PhD. And I stayed there to do an extra year uh, working on quantum communications. And then I moved, if you could go to the next slide, yes. Uh, and then I moved again further north, uh, uh, next slide, uh, to Strathclyde in Glasgow, where I worked on satellite-based quantum communications. So that's kind of been the, the roadmap. And um, just to describe what I'm working on in satellite quantum communications, we'll just cover that now. If you could go on the next slide, please. So what are satellite-based quantum communications? Um, recently, I was involved in making an animation. So the link you can have a look at um, perhaps after the talk. But just to go over what it is, um, if we recall the picture of these fiber optical networks that Catherine showed in her talk, there's, it has huge losses. So when you want to communicate, really, the two end nodes, Alice and Bob, they they practically can't be further than 100 kilometers apart. So that's a bit of a uh, problem if you want to make a call, say, to the US where, you know, you're much over the 100 kilometer limit. So um, if you could go on the next slide. So th the typical picture is that these photons, they usually uh, they're lost due to the losses. And if they lost, then the information also gets lost. So one way around that is if you could go to the next slide. Uh, is to use space because doesn't space have vacuum? So is there not no loss? Uh, well, not quite. It does have loss, uh, albeit just much less. And that's really the key principle. So next slide, please. And that's where this satellite based picture comes in, where you're firing these single photons, ideally, or laser. OK, uh, next slide, please. So this is a massive engineering uh, an experimental difficulty and there's a lot of groups across the UK and across the world that are working to try and realize key milestones to realize the whole network of these satellites working and integrating with our current infrastructure. OK, next slide, please. So what I work on is really the theory side. I'm trying to model the performance and see how we can improve it and ideally try to guide experimental and engineering efforts. Um, and a lot of the experiments are doing proof of principle experiments to make sure things work as expected. And then there's a whole engineering side before launch. Uh, if you go on the next slide. Uh, but what really happens is the theory and experimental efforts really are working hand in hand. OK, and uh, then there will be a short burst of the engineering before launch. So. Yeah, it, just to kind of summarize. Um, maths. Um, engineering, all that kind of stuff really is important when it comes to, uh, you know, some of the work that I do. So if this is something that you're interested in, it's certainly accessible if you're doing maths, physics or even chemistry, because it gets you thinking in all those lines. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So, yeah, thank you very much. That's that's me. Thank you very much, everyone, um, to Ross, Catherine, um, Jasminda and Ruth um, for showcasing um, quantum physics. Um, so now we've gone open the questions up to everyone who would like to ask a question. Um, please use the Q&A chat 
um, where we will try and get through as many questions as we can. And I've got a few coming through already. Um, so first question is, what inspired you to be a researcher? Not sure who would like to take that one. Maybe I could start us off there. Yeah. Uh, so to be honest, as I said in my talk, I was still, when I was an undergraduate, I was still aiming uh, to be a nuclear engineer and go off into industry. Uh, and at a university, the people who do the teaching are researchers themselves. Um, so I, it was just through engaging with them, finding out more about what the job was and what they were actually doing um, was just really intriguing. So it's, it's cutting edge stuff. Uh, this is things that you're developing, which will in 10, 20 years time actually get out into the real world and make a difference. Um, and it was, again, it was just lots of interesting things were, were going on. Me, it was my third and fourth year experimental projects in my degree. So in a uh, third year of degree, you do a half year experimental project. In fourth year, you do a full year experimental project. You're actually in the lab with the researchers. It just looked really good. You got, there's lots of uh, sort of, lots of different equipment you could use and it was nice to sort of for me because I work experimentally with optics and stuff it was nice to see the effect of what you were doing turn up on the computer screen monitor or sort of on the other side of the room it's like to see to actually see these processes happen was pretty amazing yeah I'm happy to add to that uh, so from my side it was a kind of perceived impact uh, so you know doing my undergraduate uh, there were two key um, lectures or courses that I really liked. One was kind of related to what Ross is saying. It was on fusion and fusion research was um, quite big at Imperial and obviously the energy demand, climate change, that was really kind of a, and I still think it is, it's defining uh, research of our times. And another thing was really quantum computing. That was also very big at Imperial. And you know, I, I was driven by a desire to understand it and eventually make an impact. And going on then to do a PhD, I realized there was a, already a, an established network of collaborative um, framework where a lot of researchers are working already towards this goal. So it was really exciting to be part of that. Thank you very much. Um, the next question we've got is how developed is the technology and how long does it take? Maybe I could start off again. Uh, so I, I guess all the technologies we're working on in the hubs, the quantum technologies are all at different levels. So there's there's some parts of quantum communication, such as some of the sources and detectors that we use, which are quite mature. Uh, and they're at a stage where small companies are actually developing these to sell to, to larger companies. So the proof of concept has been, has been done. And now it's actually that first generation of industrialization. Um, so those technologies, I would say at the beginning of my PhD about 10 years ago, uh, were, were just getting to the stage in the lab where the results were, were getting a lot of attention uh, and there was a pr they were showing promise. So it, it varies, I'd say about five to 10 years, if a technology is promising at a university level and they've shown a proof of concept for it to get out into the real world. And then, of course, once it's in the real world, then it's up to these bigger companies, you know, like BT, uh, to actually create services around them, uh, and that can that can take a bit longer as well. Uh, just to quickly add on to that, um, you know, talking about quantum communications, uh, we already have quantum communications established. There's a quantum network al along major cities all across, you know, the world actually, and in the UK, there's a link between Cambridge, London. Uh, along the south. So these things are established, but what we're trying to now do, at least with the satellite quantum communications, is extend the reach of these networks, uh, well, ideally globally, and then that really requires a huge push. So we're really looking, without putting figures on this, but, you know, we're looking at perhaps 10 plus years, you know, so it, it's a huge engineering effort to try and realise some of these things. Thank you very much. Um, the next question we've got is about quantum and nanosensors, how to combine them and what are the latest references in this field? If anyone could answer that. 
I think that one might actually, I mean, I can't answer it. Um, one of the other technology hubs that might be able to answer, so the, the sensing hub, um, which is, I'm not sure, James, is that in two months' time, next month? Yes. So, yeah, we'll consider that date um, for the next talks and um, I'll get them to refer them back to that one. Um, the next question we've got in is how do gamma rays look in reality? So gamma rays, uh, they, they are um, electromagnetic waves, OK? So how they look in reality? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to play my theoretical card, so I, I know how they look on paper, OK? <laughs> Uh, perhaps Catherine will be best to see, but yeah, they're on a different spectrum in terms of their frequency. Uh, obviously, we can see the visible spectrum, so we can't really see uh, smaller, you know, frequencies that are outside the visible wavelengths. So I'm not sure you'll be able to see it, but you'll definitely be able to, you know, feel the impact because it's on the radioactive side, so highly energetic. Um, that's a perfect answer. I cannot add to that. <laughs> no, um, we have very difficult questions coming in. Um, the next one is, um, what do you think is the most amazing technology um, these ideas might lead to, like mobile phones or internet impact? And when will we see it? Uh, maybe I could start us off again. Uh, I guess Jasmine, there's kind of highlighted it when his in one of the last questions about building up these large scale quantum networks. Uh, so although our kind of focus here in this hub is, is secure quantum communications, developing these global scaling uh, quantum networks enables us to do things like um, uh, quantum computing over large scales, enables you to actually take quant you know, the quantum signals from quantum sensors to different places as well. So what we're trying to do is beyond quantum communications to create a global quantum internet, essentially. So where we can connect quantum devices up without having to transfer the information into classical uh, and then transport it. So being able to do that over a global scale essentially opens up, you know, I, I, I just think about communications. I can't think about that kind of scale of things um, just yet. But there's people who, who are thinking about these things all the time. So. And again, as Jasmine says, we have some fiber networks around the world. Uh, we're creating these satellite links, which will be five to ten years. And I think, you know, the global quantum internet will come in some form shortly after that. Thank you. Um, another question um, that's come in is how hard is it to get your PhD in physics? It takes quite a lot of effort. Um, it's sort of generally three and a half to four years. Um, so there are different ways you can do it. So you can do theory, PhD, you could expand on some PhDs, you can do a combination of both. So what you do is you'll have a supervisor. Uh, they will say, we want you to look at this and then you'll have, they'll well, depending on the, le the level of supervisor. So if your uh, supervisor is somebody who's uh, a professor, they will normally then delegate you to somebody like me, who's a postdoc, who's lower down the food chain. Um, and then they're the people you'll interact with sort of every day, sort of, and they work with you. So you're generally not left on your own. So you work with somebody else, normally on something that's either, it can sometimes be something that's uh, already being researched or it can sometimes be something that's telling you and then um, sort of towards the end of that you've got to write up your big thesis about everything that you've done and then sort of talk about it you have like an oral exam um, about what you've done which is normally just so why did you do this oh okay fair enough um, so it, it is hard it can be very stressful but it can also be very rewarding when you actually see something you've worked on work Thank you for that. Um, the next question we've got is um, from a school in Surrey asking, how did the thinking of recent famous scientists you have met influence your decision? Uh, I can start with that one. So 
again, when I was in high school, I was always wanting to do nuclear engineering and engineering is actually the degree I was planning to do. Um, I read a book by Jim Al-Khalili uh, about physics uh, and particle physics and, and fundamental quantum uh, and it, just the thinking in it, um, the open ideas and what was possible really changed me from saying actually, you know, engineering is great, but actually I'd like to learn a bit more about the physics side uh, and do applied physics. Uh, and I actually met him in person a few years later and I said that and my, my PhD student uh, gave a sarcastic thank you to Jim Alcalili for uh, taking me down the physics route. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the next one is again the same school asking how much more difficult is a physics in the university compared to A levels? I would say that it starts off incrementally. You do you do start with uh, some notions that you are familiar with, you know, so you'll start off perhaps with mechanics where you know certain quantities are conserved like energy momentum, that kind of stuff. And you gradually work up on that and you will find there are some modules that you don't like. That's OK. Physics is very broad. That's something that Catherine was saying. It's something I certainly relate to as well. Uh, and you'll find some things that you really enjoy. And it's more of an incremental year by year increase in terms of difficulty and also scope. Thank you for that. Uh, we'll just do the next. We've got about three or four more questions to get through. And then if there's any more, we'll try and get them answered afterwards. Is um, first one is how do they lengthen the range of the fiber optics? Uh, could you repeat that again? Sorry. What was... um, the questions um, asked was how do they lengthen the range of the fiber optics? OK, so um, I presume that's for, for example, communications or something, right? Yes. Yeah. Right. So the problem there really is that um, fiber optics are inherently lossy. What that means is if you if you use a photon to encode your information and it's traveling through this optical fiber, typically it will reach up to a maximum of about 100 kilometers, as I mentioned previously, before it dissipates. OK, so what that means is the information it carries gets lost. So really what we we don't want to do is uh, just use a longer piece of uh, optical fiber. There's two technologies you can use, something called a quantum repeater. OK, so what it does, you can't copy, I should add, quantum information. That's just the fundamental difference to classical information. But just like in classical uh, communications where you have classical repeaters, there's an analog of that, which is called a quantum repeater. So you can use a quantum repeater uh, to extend the communication channel or the other route would be to use these satellite links where the loss is a lot less. So those will be two strategies to extend the reach of communications. Thank you. Um, the next one is how long does it take to put a satellite into space and how long do you control where the satellite moves? Um, happy to take that. Yeah, I'm happy to take that. OK, so um, traditional satellites are very bulky. They, t they have a large development time, OK? And actually, the Chinese Missius satellite is a traditional satellite. It's a very big one. Uh, in quantum communications now in the hub, we're working on these small satellites. So literally about this size, OK? And these are a lot cheaper, so a lot more rapid development times. Uh, but that's still the kind of uh, quantum technologies. They have to be made space ready, you know? So there's a lot of radiation. There's a lot of vibration. There's a lot of um work that still needs to be gone in but it's faster than the your traditional satellites um in terms of the orbits there are different orbits like low earth orbits medium earth geostationary and they come with different properties so it really depends on the application that you're thinking of uh, i would say thank you very much and the final question um uh, what probably would go to all of you is what advice would you give on choosing options for university in particular to study quantum technology? I, I can uh, start off there. So in terms of physics, uh, most I mean, one thing to look for when you're choosing, especially a physics degree is, is it accredited by the Institute of Physics? Um, if it is, then it means that you know that course has to cover certain topics in order for it to be accredited. 
So that means there's a kind of similar theme of, of topics across a, a wide range of universities. If you're really interested in uh, a, sub, a particular subject, whether it's particle, quantum, space, uh, then a lot of universities look at the researchers at the university. What, what is that university known for in terms of research? And um, so here we what it does photonics and quantum. Uh, what does photonics mean? It's about light generation, light manipulation, and light detection, uh, and of course quantum, which is what we're talking about today. Um, so we have accredited physics degrees, um, but our main staff specialist is photonics and quantum. So if you're interested in that aspect, you can actually get you know these summer internship opportunities um, to to work in those labs uh, and also the kind of spin on the topics that you learn about are all towards photonics and quantum. Um, so I, again, if you're really interested in a specific subject, uh, look at what the researchers are doing at the university. I agree with that. So on uh, most university websites, if you pull up, say, the physics page, it will have a link to sort of the major research groups within that. So if you, normally it will just come up as a list of headings. So if you just see that they specialise in particles, specialise in quantum, etc., it's a good way to find out what they do. Also, if you can, I would recommend going to an open day because then you can find out sort of what subjects the department actually sort of plugs the most. So I went to some open days and they plugged uh, space science a lot and I wasn't overly interested in space science, so I, that's why I didn't go there in the end. So if you could go to an open day, you get the feel of what the department actually really enjoys looking at. So that can also be have quite a large influence on whether you think you would like to sort of study there. Thank you very much and um, thank you all for joining us today um, and we hope you enjoyed the talk and thank you for all the questions coming through um, and we'll try and get them answered and um, added to our website um, for you to view afterwards. Um, just to let you know our next talk is on the 16th of June and it will be looking at quantum technologies in measurement um, so we hope you can join us then but in the meantime um, thank you for Ross, Catherine, um, Jasminda and Ruth for joining us today and we wish you a great day. Thank you very much, folks. Thank you. Thank you.